on this edition of the program. What the headless primaries tell us about the general and the internet and the modern election. We talk about all of it with Sasha Eisenberg. It's all coming up. Hello and welcome everybody to the Politics, Politics, Politics program for April 5th, 2024. Your old pal Justin Robert Young joining you from Austin, Texas. Now, obviously, we are a very present program. We are a, uh, a program that is looking forward to how the now affects the future. The future, of course, always being the election this November. But the primaries, the ones that, you know, I would have loved to be flying around to and covering in person if it weren't for the fact that they were non-existent, are indeed existent. They are still happening. They happen whether or not there are candidates that actually care about them. And so they have happened over the last week. Indeed, these would usually be the like make or break. Either there's something that is happening here or we should shut it down primaries. New York, Wisconsin, Connecticut, and Rhode Island to be specific. They happened on Tuesday, and we do have results. And while they are not really good data in that you had people that were running for them, they are telling in their own way. Indeed, President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump faced notable resistance amongst the most hardcore people that turned out knowing this was not an actual contest, signaling challenges as they aim to consolidate party support ahead of the general elections. While Trump dissenters mainly emerged in areas that were already considered lost to Republicans, Biden's issues appeared more concerning due to the protest votes coming from within the Democratic core base. Specifically, in Connecticut and Rhode Island, where voters could choose uncommitted, and in Wisconsin, where its uninstructed delegation option was available, Biden's weaknesses were evident this week, particularly in cities with significant college populations, underscoring a potential vulnerability in crucial swing states. Remember that even in deep, deep, deep red states, let alone gigantic swing states that Joe Biden's going to need, College cities are blue. You know, they're often the only blue in that gigantic deep red portfolio in some of these states. But let's get back to Trump. Despite Nikki Haley's withdrawal from the Republican presidential primary, she still secured substantial voters in affluent Connecticut towns and the GOP stronghold counties around Milwaukee reflecting some suburban Republican voters' hesitancy toward Big Chungus. This trend, of course, continued in New York's primary, with Haley's performing strongly in several counties, although the full extent of the protest vote remains unclear. It is very specific that Democratic protest votes in New York are not known. <laughs> They're not known because New York takes a long time to count votes. It's one of those things. The outcome suggests that Biden and Trump both need to address internal party dissent to solidify their general election bases as the big date approaches. Trump is leading in polls across swing states. Biden faces more immediate challenges in rallying his core voters. Here's the big deal. Uh, Donald Trump's problem is the same problem that he has had since 2020. Can you convince suburban, formerly solid Republican voters to either vote for you or stay home? That's it. It's pretty simple. And those that are not voting for you, that you were counting on voting for you, can you replace them with either blue collar voters who continue to ally themselves with the MAGA base, especially in 
the Rust Belt states like Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania? Or can you make them not vote for Joe Biden? The problem in 2020 was they voted for Joe Biden. That was it. And again, these were very, very thin margins in all these states. Meanwhile, on the Biden side, you've got a lot of really, really troubling base problems. You've got problems with young people. You've got problems with Latinos. You've got problems with blacks. You've got problems with Asians. You have problems with, well, the core people that always turn out and vote for you. Let's not even get in to Muslims, especially when you are talking about Michigan. And so, Joe Biden is in a position that he has proven himself particularly inept at dealing with. Telling a story that makes people compelled. The Biden administration, and indeed the campaign thus far, has proven themselves very, very adept at explaining away problems. The border isn't that big of a deal. The economy is actually great. They have similarly found themselves in a pretty milquetoast way Enable to talk about their strengths. We're going to make Roe the law of the land. Cool. The same thing that Democratic candidates for president have said forever. Entirely unreflective of the fact that for most voters who feel very, very, very imperiled by this, this is a different situation than any election that they've ever had. Now, I don't know if the Biden campaign is going to get better about this. But I do know that this data right here, while incomplete, while something that will be very, very, very dismissed as uh, bedwetter nonsense, is another log on a raging fire. One that says that the Biden campaign is quite simply asleep at the wheel. Something that people said about the 2020 campaign. But that was a very strange election. This is going to be more like 2016. And in 2016, an unpopular establishment Democrat lost to Donald Trump. Will Joe Biden change directions? History says no. He is entirely insulated. It takes a long time for him to make any kind of changes. And even then, he's going to faint in a million ways before he actually does it. Should he be worried? Absolutely. Now, on the Donald Trump side, he's got the same problems he's always had. I don't think he's particularly worried about it. But would it be a coup for him to bring the party together? Absolutely. How could he start? Well, number one, he could uh, uh, make the House kiss and make up. If Donald Trump said, hey, Speaker Johnson, Marjorie Taylor Greene, knock it off. You guys are going to move the agenda forward and you're going to move the agenda forward when I'm president. So get used to working together and stop sniping at each other through the media. And meanwhile, let's work toward a world where Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis speak at the RNC. Now, the old Trump world would not care about that. And... There's probably an argument to say that the Donald Trump that exists right now probably doesn't care about that much. But if the new Trump campaign is as 
coherent and efficient as we have given it credit for. I got to assume that they do. And if they do, then, well, these kind of numbers show that there's some calls to make. This is your update brought to you by TakePoliticsSeriously.com. $3 level. Get you two bonus episodes each and every week. TakePoliticsSeriously.com. Come on. Three bucks. Price of a cup of coffee. If you'd pay me a cup of coffee to talk to you in these two, uh, two times a week, well, come on. It's easy. I'd split I'd, I'd split the coffee. I'd only drink half the coffee during one episode. The next episode, I'd finish the coffee. You don't have to buy me coffee twice, just once. Let's get into the news because there's some, there's some biggins in here, including this. No labels. The bipartisan group announced that it will not launch a third-party presidential ticket for the 2024 election due to the inability to identify suitable candidates with a realistic chance of winning. The decision comes after speculation and concern from both major parties about the potential impact of a third party bid, especially given the polarized figures of Biden and Trump. Despite exploring several potential candidates, including Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, Chris Christie, Brian Kemp, Joe Manchin, and on, and on, and on. No labels failed to secure a viable contender. The move signals a consolidation of the upcoming presidential contest between Biden, Trump, and now pretty much solidifies RFK Jr. as the number one third-party candidate. It alleviates fears amongst Democrats that a third-party candidacy could split the vote and inadvertently benefit Donald Trump. Progressive groups like MoveOn.org have urged other potential third-party candidates, including RFK Jr., to step aside. Guess what? He's not. And, you know, a lot of ballot access that was gained by no labels, you know, while there, there, there might be no labels... If I were the RFK Jr. campaign, I would be asking if there is yes price tag. Can we uh, facilitate a little deal to make sure that RFK Jr. gets on the ballot in all of those states? Be very, very curious. President Biden communicated to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu the urgent need for a ceasefire and release of hostages in Gaza, emphasizing the importance of Israel taking concrete steps to reduce civilian harm and ensure the safety of humanitarian workers. This discussion comes in the wake of the Israeli attack and resulting deaths of seven World Central Kitchen aid workers, Biden's push for a ceasefire, which includes a call for at least a six-week halt to facilitate human aid and hostage release, indicates a potential shift in U.S. policy based on Israel's actions to address these concerns. The White House is advocating for immediate Israeli measures to improve the humanitarian situation and protect civilians with U.S. policy adjustments on the horizon, quote-unquote, depending on Israel's responsiveness. The development reflects growing tensions and the need for significant action to address the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, where the conflict has already caused extensive casualties and suffering. In the words of the Bard, this is sound and fury signifying nothing. If Joe Biden is saying that he is demanding a ceasefire in Gaza contingent upon release of hostages, then he is saying, I'm doing the same thing I have done for the last three months. That has been the stated U.S. position. The U.S. has not been on the sidelines 
with this, no matter how much the progressive left yells. This has been their position. The problem is that it takes two to tango. By all reporting, any kind of negotiations that have happened between Hamas, which again is split. You have the Qatari contingent of Hamas that is negotiating, and then you have the actual people in Gaza, which by all reports, it's not exactly a a, a text relationship between the two. They know they're being monitored, so they have to go uh, around Annie and everybody to to know, number one, what they're negotiating with, but also whether or not what happens in, you know, by way of the Qatari contingent is going to be carried out in Gaza, that there is no deal. Israel wants to make a deal. At least we can surmise that by the fact that Israel has moved by reporting the amount of uh, prisoners that they are willing to release up. Usually that doesn't happen. You don't see that reporting if they're not willing to make a deal. I have not seen a lot of reporting that says that Hamas wants to make this deal. And you can understand why not. If they give up the remaining hostages that they have, then the only thing that's left is for the IDF to hunt down Hamas and not care about anything else. And the IDF has shown very, very little care for civilian casualties as they're going after Hamas now. Can you imagine how little they would care if there was no worry that they would kill a hostage by accident? So, yeah, it turns out this entirely cynical and dark situation remains, well, entirely cynical and dark. Joe Biden does not control it. Boy, (laughs) considering where he is electorally, he wishes he could. And finally, Senator Jackie Rosen is setting a new record with $14 million dollars in advertising the largest in nevada's history as she prepares for her critical senate race deemed a toss-up by the cook political report the ad buy spans from late july through november and targets tv and radio audiences in the las vegas and reno markets marking a significant effort to maintain democratic control of the senate Amidst a heated Republican primary featuring MAGA-aligned Jeff Gunther and Army veteran, uh, veteran Sam Brown, who has the support of the National Republican Senatorial Committee, Rosen's campaign aims to highlight her bipartisan and effective track record. The move reflects the growing Democratic concerns over the 2024 electoral prospects in Nevada, a state narrowly won by President Biden in 2020, where former President Donald Trump is currently leading in the polls. So what does this mean? Well, it means that if you live in Nevada, which by the numbers means that you probably live in Clark County, and if you don't live in Clark County, you probably live in Reno, that you're going to hear a lot of Jackie Rosen ads if you listen to the radio. You are going to see a lot of Jackie Rosen ads if you watch television. You're probably going to see a lot of them in, you know, your your YouTube and your Fubo and all that as well. But right now, $14 million means, boy, there's going to be a lot of Jackie. Jackie, Jackie, Jackie. That's, that's, that's going to be it. Now, it's smart. It shows that the Democrats have a money advantage, which this is how you press a money advantage. You buy the ads before anybody else can buy them. It means that every time during, you know, the July through November uh, uh, time, not only will you see a Jackie Rosen ad, you'll probably see one first. So Sam Brown's probably going to win that primary. Uh, uh, 
you will see Jackie Rose and then Sam Brown. Like, and that's why it's going to happen. They bought first. That being said, in our ever-shifting media landscape, I do wonder, because one of the things that I hear a lot from you guys is, oh my God, am I tired of political advertising? I do wonder if there is a little bit of a turnout dampening from a blanket campaign like this. And 14 million bucks spent over three months, who boy, that's gonna be a lot of advertising. I don't know when it's gonna happen where somebody gets damaged by buying too much, but I do know that media's never been lower Political dollars have never been higher. And if we were ever going to hit a breaking point, it would probably be soon. Here's something else that should happen soon. You, the free listener to this show, heading on over to TakePoliticsSeriously.com. At TakePoliticsSeriously.com, you can get two bonus episodes of this show covering all the news that we miss on our free podcasting schedule. Come on, treat yourself. Do it. Take politics seriously dot com. My guest today is the author of The Lie Detectives in Search of a Playbook for Winning Elections in the Disinformation Age. He is Sasha Eisenberg. How you doing, Sasha? Doing well. Thanks for being uh, for bringing me in, Justin. Glad to be here. Oh, I mean, like this is all my 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 favorite stuff. Uh, uh, you know, the X's and O's of winning campaigns, the people that do it, and especially from a, a tech angle, which is something that I am very very interested in. So, you've previously written a book, The Victory Lab, about winning in the digital age. What brought you into the idea of uh, this specific story? Yeah, so that book came out in 2012, and it was it was largely about uh, the innovations of the previous decade. Two big ones: all the data that had become available to campaigns that they were using to uh, profile voters with statistical models, and the use of experiments, uh, uh, testing what actually worked in the field. That for the first time was letting campaigns know um, what was what was effective, uh, and. It was largely a happy story. I'd written about innovation in campaigns during that period. Campaigns were using their knowledge of individual voters to better tailor uh, the information and arguments that they were bringing based on what they expected a, a, a voter's interests or concerns would be. And at the same time, they were using, they were getting better, mostly at the work of registering and turning out voters, which is what the experiments were sort of better at measuring. And and so I wrote this, you know, pretty optimistic book about a, st a story in which campaigns were, were doing better at engaging people as human beings, as opposed to some sort of like faceless mass of electorate. And the book had very little to do with the internet, just because a lot of what I was writing about were people getting better at direct mail or at door knocking. Yeah. But it was of a piece with a way we were talking about the impact that the internet was having on campaigns. And I think, you know, you can look at how we talked about uh, the Obama campaign of 2008 using sort of primitive social media to allow to allow supporters to get more directly involved without having to necessarily go through a campaign apparatus. We were talking about, you know, I, um, I, I, my book went to the publisher right at the beginnings of the, uh, uh, or I began work on it right around the time that the Arab Spring was beginning and the story we mm -hmm. told about um, the mythology about that, you know, in Egypt was that one guy with a Twitter account who did not, he did not control the newspaper. He did not have a long term, you know, political uh, uh, organization. He didn't have a state radio station, but he could send out one tweet telling people yeah. to come down to Tahrir Square and all of a sudden a mass movement forms. And that was a story about the barriers to entry to political engagement falling because of the Internet. And what I've had to reckon with is the ways in which my book. I was probably naive. I think many of us were naive about about the consequences of those barriers falling. And one of the things that happens is, yes, a lot of well-meaning people can get involved in the political process um, in ways that they couldn't before. But we've seen a lot of bad actors get involved in the political process, too, using social media to drive people away from the process, to confuse and mislead them. And so this book is an effort 
to kind of return to that sphere of, of political innovation and, and get a hold on what the sort of smartest people are thinking about how to track, measure, anticipate, and respond to uh, uh, disinformation online. Yeah, you only really need to look at some of the conversations and reporting around, let's say, for example, the Obama campaign's use of Facebook information in 2008 to Cambridge Analytica's, the conversation around that to understand how far we went between here and there. What, the, the, the stuff that you were largely talking about in that book was uh, uh, – a, a quantum leap evolution of direct mail and organizing and A-B testing that was available right. yeah. for cheap in, in a way that it was never before. And then obviously we evolve and evolve and evolve. Now, this is where I get very, very interested because disinformation and misinformation is obviously something that is uh, prevalent in our Internet culture uh, and, and has been since the earliest BBS board. Uh, yeah. I've always found politics a uniquely challenging place to quantify it because by its very definition, politics is a, a, a resume battle, right? You are, you are trying to highlight your strengths. You are trying to magnify your opponent's weaknesses. So how, when you're walking into a, a challenge like this, how do you view that line of misinformation yeah. and disinformation? So I, I so so let me just start with like academic researchers draw a distinction between disinformation, misinformation. The other category is malinformation. Um, mm -hmm. Disinformation, falsehoods with the goal, the the intent to to deceive. Misinformation, something that's just inaccurate. Malinformation, something that's lacking the the necessary context to be sort of fully understood. the The truth is, for political communicators, the people I write about in this book, those distinctions are are meaningless. And yeah. And more importantly, as I think you're you're saying, Justin, like, you know, let's be clear, people have been lying in politics forever. They were lying. <laughs> there was they were lying before there was electricity to amplify their lies. They were lying. Yes. Before yes. the printing press could, uh, uh, you know, make copies of their lies, and um, and so I think that the central shift in the story I'm telling. And, and I begin my story in 2016 because that was the moment in which I think the American political class, the folks that I'm, I'm um, writing about in this book started to understand the ways in which the movement of information online could be a, a threat to the way that they thought about running campaigns. And ultimately the big, what, what became clear to me over the year and a half, year, year and a half I was reporting on this and in the writing is that fundamentally for political communicators, so people inside campaigns, party organizations, such, the important distinction is not between true and false. It is between sort of centralized and decentralized media. And so the lies that if you were running a campaign, yeah, the, you were worried about what your opponent said. And, and uh, your opponent was in another candidate or, or party uh, maybe it was a an established organization, a political action committee, or a uh, labor union that was spending money in in a campaign. Maybe it was a news organization, it was a commentator on TV, or it was the local newspaper. And you disagreed with what they said. Um, you could push back on them. You could. They were either a political actor who was held under the same constraints you were, they had to report their mm -hmm. spending, they had to be fairly transparent about certain aspects of what they were doing. Uh, if a TV station broadcast one of your opponent's ads that you thought was a falsehood, you got your lawyer to send a letter demanding that they take it down. Um, they were accountable to the F Federal Communications Commission for what they aired. Um, and you, and if you thought your opponent was lying, you could go to voters, and people often did. The process was sort of like, if I thought you were lying about me, Justin, I would try yeah. to get the local newspaper to write, Justin's a liar on this issue, and do an editorial scolding you, or have a front page story looking at, yeah. he has an inconsistent Provi history provide, of provide, telling provide the all, truth. Yeah, yeah, provide all the evidence to a, and then, a reporter and say, hey, right. we, we and are then what, And then what do I do yeah. once, once that piece runs? What do I do? I put in a TV ad with a, with a yes. torn, torn from... <laughs> you know, ripped from the paper headline saying, you know, yeah. Young is a liar. Um, mm -hmm. And then I use that to my effect and I run an ad that says like, Justin can't be tell, you know, trusted to tell the truth about social security. Why would you trust him with your life savings or whatever? And like, and I, 
at least you can use the what people are saying about you to hold to to try to get voters to hold them accountable or their donors or their supporters what really changed i think in the sort of post 2016 era is the way in which those those barriers to entry lowering allowed all sorts of people to become political communicators who could never have reached an audience at scope and scale previously. And that is yeah. individuals, some of whom are anonymous, but you know, the like proverbial person in their basement who now can talk at a presidential campaign or about them and reach potentially millions of people. Um, some folks who are not actually trying to win elections, but realize that they can win, make money off of advertising clicks. I mean, there were these great stories after the 2016 election about a town in Macedonia where yes, a bunch of teenagers the Macedonian realized- Macedonian teens. Yes, right? Like they're not accountable. They're not regulated so, so, by the so FEC. So forgotten, so, so forgotten in the world yeah. of fake news are the Macedonian teens. Real pioneers. Um, pioneers. And, look, and what did they realize? They, they wanted to make money off of, off of ad clicks. They yes. realized that Americans would click on political stuff more if it wasn't true and was provocative than if it was true. Yeah, and, 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 and yeah, and this is the, folks for for folks who did not. Uh, yeah. me and Sasha are bonding based on uh, our knowledge of this particular story. But uh, uh, for folks who are not aware of it, don't don't remember it. This was the first time that I remember seeing the term fake news, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, where it was literal fake news. So they would uh, go through Facebook predominantly and it would report things like Hillary Clinton dead of a heart attack or Hillary Clinton right. arrested. And it would go to a janky website that was set up by a Macedonian team that would just be lined by these chum advertisements that – somebody would accidentally click and yes the, the the rate was vanishingly small but if you can get x amount of people to accidentally go to it then by the the nature of those ads these teens which again a little bit of money goes a long way in macedonia yeah. were making uh, uh, uh hundreds of dollars which for them was the greatest thing that's ever happened but that was and, the first time that i ever remember it was right after election news. day in november 2016 buzzfeed yes. did an amazing story on this and what became clear is the kids didn't hate hillary clinton or like donald trump no. they just realized that there was money to make from this right and so yeah so getting the getting the columbus dispatch to scold you know vladimir for making disinformation like that doesn't accomplish anything for anybody right no and and you know and the same thing is true of of foreign intelligence services that now can play in our politics and so the the whole playbook about what you respond to and when and how was shaped by in an era where 20th century media dominated where your political opponents your political opponent was the person who's communicating against you. Their advertisements were visible. You could go down. They, they had to disclose what they were buying and where. Um, where newspapers and TV networks uh, carried most of the political content to to uh, to voters. And now political communicators have to reckon with this decentralized environment where everybody's a political communicator. They're not operating under the same rules and constraints you are. You can't hold them accountable because they don't actually exist in our political system. And what do you do? When do you decide that a given piece of, you know, a given lie about you online is worth responding to? And uh, how do you do it without, you know, as you know, one of the, the there's just, there are all sorts of reasons why just in responding to everything is a terrible idea. One of which is yes. that the internet, the internet is built especially social media is built to reward in, in engagement so if they are they are, up, they are online, up later than you they are they are uh, uh uh they are they wake up earlier than you and they have way more time on their hands you will never beat yes. them ever and and the and the way algorithms are 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 constructed is that if i respond or quote something that you write to fact check it or dunk on you often i am helping drive eyeballs to the thing itself and so yes it, 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 it is ultimately that is not figuring out what those tactics ought to be or not. They're the same if something against you is true or false. The issue is who the speaker is. So it, it feels to me what you are describing is a set of, if not firm rules, then a sort of gentleman's understanding because everybody had skin in the game if you were looking at a professional press outlet, a political actor. There was a world in which 
everybody kind of had somebody else's phone number and at the very least you would know where to go based on who made these decisions and to me the the the, the crispus addicts that starts this revolutionary war specifically in politics is matt drudge publishing a spiked story that then creates one of the biggest political scandals of our modern era and we have only seen that continue to go further where the rules have evolved 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 and changed as soon as you realize that there is no press pass that is issued for you to get on a message board now social media and say whatever you want my point of view on that is that these are just the new rules there to 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 fight or complain about them is oftentimes counterintuitive how are modern campaigns dealing with it yeah no i think that's and then that was something that i think has changed in the last few years is the acceptance that this that, that that there's no going back there is no containing this. Um, I mean, the, the platforms, the social media companies will shift their policies from year to year and it may, it may affect the way certain things can spread. Um, I think political communicators were very slow to acknowledge this because so much of their, their skill, their expertise, their, their worldview, their ego is connected to the idea that I can control what people see and think. And not everybody says it in such a godlike way, but like if you look <laughs> at how we talk about like the great, you know, Lee Atwater, James Carville, yeah. David Axelrod, Carl Rove, there is a a mythology that develops around great political communicators as these mm-hmm. persuaders because if you can shape if your TV ads are on the three networks and that's where, you know, 80% of Americans are getting their, their, their broadcast news, and you have a great gift for shaping the way that the, the big national and regional newspapers cover your candidate, you are controlling a massive share of, of the information that flows to voters. And obviously there was word of mouth. People would always go to the VFW hall. You know, Before the internet, you could go to the VFW hall and talk with your, your, your yep. friends and hear what they had to say, but that was not getting, it was not getting scale or scope. And so, yeah. you know, what, what Lee Atwater put out into the world was a large part of what voters were exposed to. And I think that, that political communicators were very slow to acknowledge the way that the Internet was changing the communications environment, the information environment. So what, what happens, you know, the episode that you mentioned with Drudge is, is 99. That's right around the time that yep. the campaigns are, you know, getting a website just as a, a sort of a matter of course. John McCain raises, um, I think, a few million dollars on the internet in 2000, and it's a huge deal. Big deal. And what what campaigns are thinking about at that point, about how to use the internet, is largely how do we translate things that we already do offline, online, to make them faster and cheaper. And so asking people for money is the big one. Yes. Um, Eventually creating tools for volunteers to do their job without having to go into a, a, an actual like storefront campaign office. So how can we get them to make phone calls at home or to print out a walk sheet at home so they don't actually have to get a clipboard from a, an organizer. But by and large, campaigns are not saying we need to rethink how we communicate. It yes. is, we, need, we, can have tran- we can change the transactional relationships we have with our supporters and reach more of them more quickly at less upfront money. And it's only, I think, really after 2016 where D- Donald Trump um, uh, is the, I don't know, if, if Matt Drudge is the Crispus Addicts, I, I, I need to brush up my, my revolutionary history. <laughs> that, revolutionary yeah. war history, sure, yeah. To, to figure out who Trump is in this. But, but, you know, what Trump does, not because he has any, I think, great uh uh he just has great instincts and and intuition about about media not that i think he has a, a and, 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 and more, more than it. any more than any candidate personally terminally yes. online right uh, uh which is something that was that was a very big difference i mean he was complaining about the love lives of the twilight cast That's long before right. he decided that he wanted to run for president and, and, and what he did was he sent a signal, mostly because he was up at 4 a.m. tweeting about whatever was on his mind. He sent, and, mm-hmm. then, and then retweeting or sharing content that his supporters had made, even if it was in conflict with the, the sort of message of the day, right? Like, yeah. he was sending a message to his supporters that their content mattered and encouraging them to create content on behalf of the campaign. 
Barack Obama, for all we talk about the way that he used the, his campaigns used the internet to engage supporters, he never sent a signal to his supporters that what you have to say about the campaign or about my opponents or about the issues matters. It was share, at best it was, here's my YouTube video with Will I Am, share it. Um, and yes. And so, so there was a, Trump sent a message, not in a, in, in a particularly strategic way, that his supporters should cre develop and maintain relationships online on his behalf and that he would be part of the community that they were building. And what, what has happened is that, you know, MAGA is a deeper, more meaningful online community for, for, for those who are part of it than anything Obama or Howard Dean created among, among mm -hmm. their supporters, in part because they never were willing to relinquish control for communicating. And so yeah. that, that fundamental tension, which is David Axelrod wants to still kind of control the information flow to voters while the digital part of the campaign he's running is asking them for money and to do volunteer shifts, but not actually asking them to communicate. Trump sort of blew up that, that idea. And I think we're now finally in the period where political communicators are realizing you, you're, you, you have to work with the internet as, as, as it exists and not try to cherry pick what you think you can do there and, 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 and do the old stuff the old way. Which of course opens up a whole new can of worms because anybody who has spent any time on the internet knows that not every rabbit hole that you want to go down is a fruitful one. And when you are dealing with gigantic political campaigns that will both probably raise over a billion dollars as they have the last few cycles, this is going to be a, a an, an extraordinary uh, a boat to shift from your perspective how much how much of the modern campaign is knowing what not to steer toward as it is understanding well this is something that the people want to talk about let's engage them on yeah so like you know the the, the way that the camp the the modern american political campaign works is it you do all this research up front policy research, issue research, opinion research, opposition research, and you decide what exactly you want to be talking about at, at every given moment of the campaign, to whom, where, how. And you do your best in theory to shift conversations towards that. Um, when this sort of online disinformation landscape flummoxes political communicators because it is just filled with potential distractions. And it, it yeah. used to be under the old model we were talking about, the sort of, we'll call the 20th century media model. The David Axelrods and Karl Rove's like had a decent intuitive sense of, okay, if it's a, a bad story on the front page of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, we need to respond to. But if it's on page 19 of the Post-Dispatch, maybe we, yes. you know, we, we hold off. We don't want to draw attention to it. Let's stick to our, our healthcare message of the day. You know, if, if this talk radio host is into that issue, that's a problem for us. But if this talk radio host isn't, like, let's not get like, get diverted. And the problem with the internet comes along and, and nobody, like, I quote one of the main characters in my book, Jory Craig, saying, like, people don't know, when it's with the internet, people don't know, know how to use their normal brains. And, <laughs> and, and you have all these political communicators like, oh, my God, there's something bad about us online. And the simple fact yeah. that you've spent any time on the internet is if you are – any sort of public figure or institution, not just a politician, but you're a celebrity, you're a sports team, you're you're a business, um, people are gonna be making stuff up about you online all day long. And um, only a very small percentage of it is probably gonna affect your ticket sales or your share price or your or your your standing in the polls. Some of it will. Right, we could come up with examples of, of institutions yep. that have been significantly damaged by episodes of, of disinformation. But as a share of the total number of you know lies or deep fakes or whatever that are out there on any given day, it's minimal. And so the problem, the, the challenge for a campaign is to isolate what what um, Rob Flaherty, who was the digital director on the Biden campaign in 2020 and is now the deputy campaign manager, uh, you know what what he called. Um, in a chapter I have on, on the Biden campaign, um, market moving disinformation. His view was, I only care about stuff if it is gonna get in the way of Joe Biden getting to 50 plus one. 
If yes. not, it's a problem for society. Maybe it's a problem for the platforms. But I only care about stuff that's going to get uh, in front of persuadable voters, a very small share of the electorate who are persuadable and change their opinions, and maybe stuff that's going to demoralize our Biden's base. And yeah, and what that. And so they did a big research project to understand what those things were that had both the reach and impact to actually move opinions. And then the lesson for everything else is like, let's keep an eye on it, but we should run this campaign on our terms. And, you know, I, we talked a little bit about how the, the, how the sort of architecture of, of social media algorithms can drive traffic to, uh, to things mm -hmm. if you engage with them. You know, there's also sort of the, the, the bigger problem for, for um, you know, there's cognitive science research that suggests if you uh, try to say a lie is false, you can end up reinforcing it in the minds of the people who are hearing it. There's what people call the Streisand effect, right? You take something that people don't know a lot about, you yep. start talking about it, they know about it, they learn about it. Um, and the bigger challenge for a campaign is how do you stay focused on your priorities day to day, what you want to be talking about without constantly playing whack-a-mole with the latest thing that's popping up online. And that requires uh, a lot of data and to intelligently make those decisions. What are, you know, so much of the, you know, from the perspective of the Biden campaign, so much of the anti-Biden or anti-Kamala stuff that, that circulates on any given day is created by Trump supporters to amuse other Trump supporters because that's, in large part, how that community a, lang a language that they like to talk to each other. It's with. it's yeah. the folk tradition of 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 MAGA. It's like let's create memes and gifts that that humiliate our opponents and yes. um and it's the love language of MAGA supporters to one another and um it's not a problem for the Biden campaign if 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 a bunch of people who are never going to vote for Biden see a bunch of bad stuff about Biden and but. Yeah. From an outsider, you could see, oh, trending topics have, you know, Creepy Joe or, you know, a thousand, ten thousand people saw this. Well, are they, are those ten thousand people uh, in in the, you know, the ten percent of voters who are persuadable in the seven states that matter? Are they in the United <laughs> exactly. States? Yeah. Are they 18 years old? Are they, um, and so, so you've created... So I write about people who've created a whole sort of data infrastructure to sort of monitor and track this so that they can make intelligent tactical decisions about, about what to ignore and have confidence that they're ignoring the right stuff. Because a lot, one of the challenges is that a lot of the politicians here who are the ultimate decision makers in their campaign are um, often are not in a, are so motivated to act. I think it was one of the like major problems of sort of resistance era lefty politics during the trip. Everybody wants to do something. And this is an area yes. where doing something is can be totally counterproductive. And so the people who are the most influential, I write about this woman, Jory Craig, who's sort of the first counter disinformation operative in American politics. Her greatest success is probably convincing campaigns to have the confidence lay off not it. lay off <laughs> it. Like it's the yeah. right thing to do. Exactly. Uh, an amazing, an amazing moment in history when a great political operative's uh, central message is touch grass, which I yeah, think many yeah. people on the internet could possibly learn a little bit more from. Uh, uh, one last thing here, and this is more yeah. of a meta conversation. From my perspective as somebody who grew up in journalism and is uh, very fascinated by the shifting economics of it, the big thing that's different now is television and print let's let's fold blogs and print into one bucket uh are not king media in the way that they used to be undisputably anymore the internet is in so many ways the place where now downstream of that you will find good morning america is covering a tiktok trend right, exactly. tiktok is very rarely saying look at this amazing thing from good morning america that has to fundamentally not only shift what you've described, which uh, you have all these operatives that are coming from essentially operating the 1960 Kennedy campaign playbook yeah. of television, newspapers. If we can control those, then we can control our own message to now something where not only do you have to worry about the random people that are saying something on a message board, but also it's going to be covered by these newsrooms on a level that it hasn't really been before. Where do you see this trend going? Do you think that we are going to continue to see this? Or from the political angle, how are they expecting it to 
continue to mature. I mean, I think we see a new, we, we have seen on the right for, I mean, one reason we see a, a, an increase in sort of partisan and ideologically motivated uh, media organizations in the U.S. is one, often there's a more sustainable business model if you're not spending a lot of money sending reporters out to to learn facts, but you're just paying people to sit around and, and, and spew opinions. It's like... Um, Yes, well, often that the, is that is that is a, the, a, a tremendous amount of the modern the, uh, landscape of what the we ledger would, sheet uh, looks a lot as a newsroom. There. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, and, and look, to, you started with Christmas addicts and jumped ahead to JFK. Let's talk about like the 19th century was filled with newspapers that picked a party and every day decided yes. what went into them based on did it help their people or not. Um, and yeah. we are increasingly returning to an era where major news organizations are motivated. And I think this is true of MSNBC. It's true of the Daily Wire. You know. Um, yes. Uh, um, they are they're, 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 they're declared combatants in this yes. field. And I think we are going. The left increasingly, I think, ignore that uh, is 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 trying to very explicitly create media organizations to advance ideological or partisan goals under the sort of rubric of media. Um, I think we can, you know, go to journalism school and argue about to what extent what they're doing is is credible journalism or not, but they are they are operating and looking like media organizations. And I suspect more yes. and more we will have um, news organizations that that, that that are providing people political information but not aspiring to the kind of neutral presence in the culture the way that the 20th century institutions did. Um, and so I think the campaigns are going to become, are, are, are more likely to work sort of in tandem with, with the allied ones to push their message. I think there's still reason to believe that, you know, that, that voters want objective sources. There's a lot of research that suggest, suggests voters want objective sources of, of information. And I think that increasingly what you'll find is you'll have stuff that looks like objective sources of information, but actually isn't really being produced with, <laughs> is not. with a, with an objective goal. Uh, it's one of the things on this show that we do all the time is, is I try to, and I didn't realize it was going to be something that would be entertainment or it would be content, but just look at a news story and, and read it in the way that I would read it as a journalist to say yeah. like, well, I don't, I don't know about that. That seems like a bit of a, a, a jump or a leap, or I wouldn't describe it like that. I would use these verbs because you're right. This is, this is not a, a world in which the, there's a lot of people that want to be an unbiased referee or want to move news forward in that kind of way. And, and this will be my last question. It, it seems like if you were to chart out the media map with that in mind, saying that there are allied players on either side, you have what I would describe as kind of a, a legacy big name newspapers and uh, uh, several television stations and a lot of the network television stations. And then on the other hand, what has outgrown of uh, AM radio and very, very active uh, kind of quote unquote non-traditional media that has allied itself and grown up, especially with the internet that has its own revenue streams uh, uh, in in opposition to to those more more liberal things. Is there anything from your perspective that you think I might be missing? No, I, I, I would just note that that's part of a, a collapsing landscape of, of trusted institutions. And we've talked about media stuff, but let's note that like over our, our lifetimes, there's been not just the decay of, of the business model of, of some of those uh, old media institutions, but less trust in, in you know scientific and academic expertise, um, diminishing trust in uh, law enforcement, the courts, uh, mm -hmm. government agencies, um, even religious institutions, like a lot of the institutions that were once sort of credible uh, moderators, communicators of, of, of truth on sort of big factual questions are all weaker today than they were when, when either of us was born. And I think that that's, uh, that's part of the the reason that lies and conspiracy theories are allowed to flourish is that there's very little of a strong um, sort of truth-based infrastructure to, to, to resist or correct them. All right. I said that was the last question. I did have one more question because okay. you brought up something really interesting. Do you think that that decay in trust is because some of these institutions have tied themselves more to uh, uh, very divisive elements like politics? Yeah, I think the cause and effect is really hard to disentangle. I mean, some of 
I mean, uh, yes, probably. Um, some of that is that as their reach shrinks, the business model, and this is kind of true of religious institutions we don't think have a business model yep. either, is that you have to cater more to your existing customer base and um, narrow. And so, and then, and then also all these institutions we talked about have been become subjects of, of conspiracy theories that take hold once they have an, a smaller customer base that people outside of it are are suspicious of it. And so I think it's a lot, of, yeah. it, it tends to be a sort of, you know, vicious cycle um, of, of sort of shrinking reliance. But the fact is that every institution, almost every institution in the 20th century catered to a large base. And this was newspapers and TV networks, also department stores, right? Like, of course, yeah. There's no mass, there are so few mass market institutions of any kind in the American economy and American culture and American media. Um, uh, you know, they, they, like Super Bowl Sunday is probably like the last thing that, that, that seems to cut across a large swath of the American public in any meaningful way. Yeah. And everything else is, it, it is so reduced that, um, and has to work harder to hold on to its, its, its share that, that I think that that's part of the cause of, of why, um, and then, in a, and then to state the obvious here, then in a very polarized political environment, if you want to cater to your audience, you have to do that in some part by taking by sending cater political to signal them. by sending political yeah. signals right yeah uh, 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 well, I'll tell you what, uh, I, I could probably talk o about this kind of stuff uh, uh, for another hour and a half, but we're going to get our guest out of here. Sasha Eisenberg is his name, and please go pick up his latest book, The Lie Detectives in Search of a Playbook for Winning Elections in the Disinformation Age. Thank you so much for joining us, Sasha. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. And that'll wrap it up for us today. Politics, Politics, Politics is written and hosted by me, Justin Robert Young, for Dog and Pony Show Audio in Austin, Texas. Our guest on the show was Sasha Eisenberg. Boy, that dude ruled. I really, really enjoyed talking to him. It's very rare that you can talk to somebody who knows as much about tech as he does about politics. And, and I think Sasha did. The Young American at gmail.com is where you can send us email. You can find clips of the show. Justin R. Young on TikTok. Justin R. Young on Instagram, on YouTube. And you want to know what? Follow our YouTube. We're doing more with the YouTube. Politics, politics, politics on YouTube. Go ahead and search it. It's the same word three times. Let's see if we can get those numbers up. Twitter is PX3 tweets for the show. Justin R. Young for me. The podcast is px3podcast.com. Share it with your friends family, and clergy. In fact, share all of those with your friends, family, and clergy. Of course, you can support us, paypal.me slash payjury with a one-time donation, send me $5, just for laughs. Venmo is justin-young-20. Venmo money isn't real. Prove it to yourself. You owe it to yourself. That Venmo money doesn't own you. Show it it isn't real. Send it to me. Justin-young-25 dollars proves that it's not real. Cash app is PX3 Cash. Send me anything you'd like in the ma mail. P.O. Box 153184, Austin, Texas 78715. Again, Post Office Box 153184, Austin, Texas 78715. Of course, you can always get our bonus podcast, plural, all of our bonus content at TakePoliticsSeriously.com. $3 tier gets you two bonus podcasts per week covering all the news that we miss on our free podcasting schedule. And if you would permit me getting the list, friends, we have the $10 tier where you can get your name right at the end of the show like these fine folks in the Titanic. $10 tier. Sam, John, Niemeister, Edwin, Invoke Gloria Young for King of the New World Order, Brian, Edison, Jeremy, a dog named Checkers, Sarah Jeannie, Spider, Matthew, Dr. G, Dustin, Brad, D Laser, Nick, Just Another Pilot, Middle Age Mike, Utah, Jimmy Montana, The Gen, Hello, D, Really? Andrew, Lisa, Fat Tony's PJs from New York. Devon the CFP, Gloria, Gray Zone, Peapaw, Jay, Neil, John, DP4, Bongo, 
Neil, his nerdiness Charles, Audrey stole Adler's spot, Darren, Idris Arzlanian, Berkeley, Stephen, Nomadic Terran, Molly's delightful demeanor, Adam, Chief Andy, Robert, Casey, and Paul. You want your name read on the show. Friends, only one place to do it. Take politics seriously. Dot com. I hope everybody has a great weekend. There's a big weekend in store for your boy. We have a huge, huge, huge event here in Austin, Texas. If you're coming down for the eclipse, I'm very excited to see you. Please say hello. Uh, we're we're, we're going to do a, a big pub crawl in... Uh, downtown Austin on Saturday, beginning at noon at Stubbs Barbecue for the Battle of the Bands. Uh, my co-host on Great Night's daughter, Josie, is performing. Uh, come on down for that. Buy tickets. It's $7. Very easy. Support Almost a Girl Band. Then Sunday, if you buy a VIP ticket at foundersdayeclipse.com, You'll hang out with me and uh, uh, so many other really, really rad people uh, at a uh, email, uh, a location. You'll get via email if you pay for it. And then, of course, the big day. Monday. The moon will quite literally cross the face of the sun, creating a total uh, blackout, a totality, as it's referred to in the biz, for a minute and 30 seconds, I've never been in the midst of a totality, but I have heard that it is a literal religious experience. I'm pumped for it, and I'm pumped to spend it with you. So come on out. But until the next time that we talk on Wednesday, this is your old pal Justin Robert Young saying... Some shows talk about politics, others talk about politics, and still more discuss politics. But this, this is the only show that dares discuss. Oh!